This is the sixth in a series of eight lectures on the doctrine of salvation, and thus far in our study we have gone through very briefly thirteen of the fifteen great words in the vocabulary of salvation, and we're not going to spend any time on the fourteenth word at this point because we'll be discussing that later under the security of the believer, and that is the word preservation. Now, the fifteenth word and the final word in this vocabulary is a word that I suppose has uh, brought more confusion to the minds of more people than perhaps any other single doctrine in the Bible, and that is the word origination. Now, really, you may not recognize that word to be very much, and I've chosen it, though, because it includes such words as that you will recognize, predestination and election and foreordination and foreknowledge, etc. So the word origination is used because uh, the fact that we're trying to answer the question now, by what means and for what reason was the plan of salvation originated? That is, why are not all men saved? What's the basis of this salvation origination? Can indeed all men be saved? Uh, someone has said if you want an argument, you can talk about religion or politics, and that's true. Now, as far as the church is concerned and church history, there are several doctrines that uh, have often been discussed to the place where they generate far more heat than they do light, and certain doctrines like baptism and the charismatic the tongue movement, the eternal security of the believer, and this subject of origination or predestination. So we're going to briefly and uh, bravely uh, discuss this final word concept now in the vocabulary of salvation. Again, the question. By what means and for what reasons was the plan of salvation originated? Why are not all men saved? If it is not God's will that any should be lost, why are any men lost? And can indeed all men be saved? Is it possible for all men to be saved? Now, the terms included. Uh, within the subject of salvation origination are eight. There are eight terms in this final word of origination. And these words that must be considered are the words decree, ordain, foreknowledge, election, counsel, predestination, purpose, and called. These are all New Testament words. Some of them are Old Testament also. They're all found in the New Testament, and they all have to deal with the subject of salvation origination. Now, let me just say at the offset, I do not have the ability to teach this the way it should be taught, not because perhaps I don't have the mental equipment, I'm sure that's possibly involved, but because these concepts cannot be fully reconciled to the human mind, and I feel as weak and helpless in discussing this subject as I do the subject of, for example, the Trinity. And we saw when we came to attempting to define uh, the Trinity, we were at a loss of words. Or I feel as weak and helpless in attempting to talk about this as to talk about the very person of God himself. The question might be asked, what is God like? And the answer is, God is not like anything on this earth that we can uh, compare, use as a model. So we can make general statements. And the third thing that I need to say is that there are two sides of this final word that must be stressed, that must not be forgotten. And the two sides, number one, is the sovereignty of God and secondly, the responsibility of man. 
These two concepts cannot be in the human mind reconciled, even remotely, down here in this veil of flesh, uh, or in this uh, tent of flesh, in this veil of tears. So we need to keep this in mind, and we're certainly not going to be able to solve this problem uh, any more than we'll be able to solve the problem of suffering or pain and some of the other things that God has allowed to happen until we get to heaven. And then I suppose it'll take him a large part of eternity to explain to us, even in our glorified bodies, everything that God had in mind. So all we'll do basically here is to read some scripture and make a few comments and uh, leave it uh, to the Spirit of God to direct you uh, in the truth that he wants you to see concerning this truth. All right, let's look at these eight words now. The first is the word decree. Notice Paul says in Colossians 1.16, For by him, speaking of Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, when we speak of a decree, we need to know uh, what we're talking about. And the Westminster Shorter Catechism defines the decree of God as follows. The decree of God is his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Let me read that again. The degree of God is his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his own will, whereby for his own glory he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Now, the word foreordained the word ordain means to put in order or to arrange, and the word for is prior. So here you have a prior arrangement in the mind of God concerning the universe, a prior arrangement, a prior putting in order. Now, let me give some, maybe not an illustration, but at least uh, let me give a, a little summary on what we'd like to say by way of introduction here. Uh, here is a, a man and wife, and they determine to uh, build a home. And so they look through a number of blueprints. Uh, they uh, check with, with the architect. They check with the contractor, and he supplies them with maybe hundreds of plans. And they want the very best plan, and so they're careful in choosing that plan. And they finally arrive at a plan, the blueprints, for their new home. It's their first home, and it's the most important home they'll probably ever buy. And they're excited about it. And so they finally uh, determine now that they'll pick this particular plan, whatever plan it is, a plan that will bring them the most amount of good. Now, in a very real sense, God's decree is the divine blueprint of eternity. And before the creation of all things, God, who knows all things, determined what set of circumstances, he determined what universe uh, type situation would bring him the most amount of glory and the elect the most amount of good. Let me repeat that. God determined what set of blueprints before he created the universe would, after he had accomplished it, number one, bring him the most amount of glory, and secondly, bring the most amount of good to the elect. And that's why God does anything that he does today. He does it for his glory and for our good. Now, in the Systematic Theology Summary by Louis Burkhoff, he lists seven characteristics involved in this blueprint or in this decree. Number one, this decree, this blueprint, is founded in divine wisdom. 
Paul says in Ephesians 3, 9 to 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's founded in divine wisdom. Paul says that he wanted all men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. And then the psalmist cries these words, cries out these words, O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom thou hast made them all. So this decree, this divine blueprint, was founded on divine wisdom. God never did a stupid thing in his life. He never created a thing that he later regretted because he, he established it in divine wisdom, whatever else we may say about it. Secondly, it is eternal. That is to say, uh, once God had effected this work and brought it into being, there will never be a time from that point on where that thing, in this case the thing happens to be the creation of the universe and the world and everything that we know, there will never be a time in eternity where this creation will not bring God glory and will not bring the elect the most amount of good. Uh, God will receive glory throughout eternity for what he has done. The elect, and that includes the elect angels as well as the elect men and women of this world, and there will never be a time when they will not receive the best, the most possible good throughout eternity. eternity. So it's based on wisdom, and the decree is eternal. And three, it is efficacious. That is to say, it is effective. It will be done. Um, the theologian has said this, Louis Burkhoff, this does not mean that God has determined to bring to pass himself by a direct application of his power all things which are included in his decree, but only that what he has decreed will certainly come to pass that nothing can thwart his purpose. It is effective. It will be done. It will be carried out. There are some men who plan things and their wise decisions, and uh, they determine to carry them out, but they don't have the ability to carry them out. And uh, so as a result, they are never even started. But God will effectively carry out everything that he has decreed in this divine blueprint. Uh, the psalmist says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Uh, Isaiah says in Isaiah 46, God speaks these words, Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So this divine blueprint of God, it is founded in divine wisdom, it is eternal, it is efficacious, and it is immutable. That is to say, it will not be altered. It will not be added to or taken away from. It is unchanging. It is immutable. Man, many times, has to alter his plans for various reasons. It may be that when he makes his plans, he lacked seriousness of purpose and decided not to go ahead with it. Or he possibly didn't realize fully what the plan involved and that he found out it cost too much or it was just uh, too big a hassle. And so man's plans are always changing. and We have to be flexible in our decisions. But God's plan is immutable and it is not based on anything, uh, the outer circumstances of this earth. And then, and that brings us to number five, it is unconditional. It is unconditional as far as the weather is concerned, 
or the goodness or badness of man, the stock market, etc., it is unconditional. That is to say, it does not depend on any outside set of circumstances. Number six, regarding God's eternal blueprint now, it is universal or it is all comprehensive. It doesn't have to do just with the good things that men do, but also the bad things. Now keep in mind that we are not saying that God has predestined the bad things that men do. Obviously, God has not done that. The Bible says that he is not the author of sin. And if a man's tempted, James says, don't let that man say, I am tempted of God, for God cannot tempt a man. So it's not that God just didn't uh, become the author of sin, but he couldn't become the author of sin. But we are saying here is that this decree includes whatsoever comes to pass in the world, whether it be physical or in the moral realm, whether it be good or evil. God has allowed this, and he has made provision for these bad things. For example, God could have allowed Adolf Hitler to have been born uh, in a country where he would have died at an early age. He could have allowed him to be born and to die at birth, but he didn't. Now, he didn't force Hitler to kill all the Jews, but God could have killed Hitler as a baby, but he didn't. So, in a very real sense of the word, God controlled the actions that led to the death of six million Jews. He didn't cause it, but in a very real sense, he was fully in control. Now, admittedly, I do not understand that because, in the first place, I would not have allowed Adolf Hitler to be born in the first place. It had been very simple not to allow him to be born, or if he was born. I would have worked some circumstances out where I think he would have uh, possibly been born in, an Amer in America and maybe be uh, born uh, near the Thomas Road Baptist Church where a bus driver could have picked him up and led him to Christ as a boy. I would have changed the eternal blueprint, but God didn't. So God is not the author. God did not predestine Hitler's evil life but he was in full control of it even before Hitler was born, before the foundation of the world. Now, admittedly, I do not even vaguely, faintly understand all this, but I accept it. God is not the author of evil, but he is the controller of all things, including the evil acts of men. And then, and this actually is tied into number six here, the final uh, statement concerning the decree of God, his eternal blueprint. It is, with reference to sin, it is permissive. Why God allowed sin to come into the universe in the first place through Lucifer, who became the devil, and then through Adam, who became the father of all uh, the human race, and uh, gave me my sin nature. Why God allowed this, we will certainly never know down here, and we may never fully know even up there. But it is, this decree, with reference to sin, permissive. In other words, and again, I'll just make the statement. I have no idea what it means. I'll make the statement. I can't comprehend it. God will eventually receive more glory, and the elect will eventually receive the more good by allowing sin to come into the universe than if God had not allowed sin to come into the universe. But this decree is, with reference to sin, it is permissive. Now, I'm going to spare you the agony of going through the next section here. Uh, to find out whether you're a supralapsarian or an infralapsarian or a sublapsarian. And uh, you may think that's some kind of a virus or maybe a new uh, uh, kind of peanut butter, uh, but these are theological terms and they are in your notes if you'd like to study them. I just put them there because 
uh, it might be good for you to... These are the 85 cents words of theology, and as soon as you learn to pronounce them, you can impress uh, the pastor or, or your congregation, and you may not understand them. Uh, but uh, there they are. Now, the second word, we've looked at the word decree, attempting now to throw some light, if we can, to gather some facts on salvation, origination. And we've looked at the word decree, now the word ordain. This is an important word in the vocabulary of salvation, origination. And um, it is, of course, the Greek word tasso, and it means to appoint or to place or put in order to arrange certain things. And this is a part of salvation origination. In the New Testament, we have three non-theological examples of this word ordained. In Matthew 28, we're told that the eleven disciples, after the resurrection of Christ, went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. He had ordained or appointed uh, uh, that they should go there. And then we have a centurion, a Greek centurion mentioned, Roman centurion, in Luke chapter 7. And he's talking to Christ, and he says, I also, you have authority, Lord, and I have authority. I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. So here is an illustration of ordain, of appointing. Uh, this uh, centurion says, Do thus and such. I appoint you to do that, and he does it. Now, salvation origination has to do with God appointing and ordaining certain things, and we're giving examples of this now in the non-theological usage of the word. Uh, Paul says in Romans 13, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, not just allowed. That's, there's more than just being uh, uh, the, the thing is allowed, but it is a point or it is to arrange. So this means that USSR and Cuba and Red China and Romania and Albania and the wicked Roman Empire of the time of Jesus and the Babylonian uh, civilization and the Philistines and the Hittites and the Egyptians and many of these ungodly powers that once existed and that exist today were ordained, not just allowed, but were ordained by God. Now, again, it may not have been his perfect will. It may have been involved in his permissive will, but they were nevertheless ordained of God, according to Paul here. Now, this helps us to perhaps... Uh, understand the theological usage of the word ordain. In verse uh, Acts 13, verse 48, the Bible says, When the Gentiles heard this, Paul here is preaching on salvation, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now, the Apostle Peter brings this out, the ordination of the elect, in First Peter 1, he said, For as much as you know you are not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained. In other words, it was a prior appointment, because the word means to appoint, and fore means prior. And so before the foundation of the world, God's Lamb was ordained. That is to say, there was a prior arrangement made between the Father and the Son that in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ would die uh, for the sins of the world. Now, let me just say, at this point, we are not talking about the reason for this ordination, but merely the, merely the fact of it. One of the words that we will study will be the word election. And everybody, all the Bible theologians, agree that the Scripture teaches election. Uh, the only problem is 
what was the basis of this election. And there are two theories here. So we're not talking about the reason for this ordination and this uh, predestination uh, and the uh, decree, but we're simply now discussing the fact of it. It is a fact. The reason for it, well, we're not sure we'll ever be able to understand that. But the fact of the matter is that God does teach uh, certain ones have been ordained. And here Jesus Christ died for these that were ordained. All right. And by the way, I do not believe in the limited atonement. Let's get that straight now when I make these statements. I need to clarify my position. Uh, I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's what the Bible says. And yet here are those that have been foreordained, according to Acts 13.48. The next word, the third word, is the word foreknowledge. And the Greek is progonisko. And this means for, of course, again, means prior. And uh, we know what knowledge is. And this progonisko, it means to know experientially, to know beforehand, knowledge beforehand, foreknowledge, as opposed to hindsight, foresight and hindsight. Uh, this prior knowledge is seen operating in the following areas. Uh, the realm of nature, the realm of creation itself. The Bible says, Acts 15, 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He knows exactly how many squirrels will be in your neighborhood, if that neighborhood continues, uh, for uh, in the year 1990 if Jesus tarries. He knows all the facts of his creation. And this prior knowledge is seen concerning the nation Israel. In Amos chapter 3, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known. By the way, this word know here also speaks of a sexual knowledge, an intimate knowledge. You only have I known in this intimate way, and I knew you before the foundation of the world, of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And this foreknowledge, uh, knowledge beforehand, is seen in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, of course. And Jesus himself speaks about the determination of God to offer himself, Jesus, on the cross. Uh, Simon Peter brings this up during the uh, sermon at Pentecost. He says, Him, speaking of Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now this foreknowledge also is seen concerning the believer. For example, God foreknew my physical condition. And Psalm 139 uh, thou knowest, God says, my down-sitting and mine uprising, and thou understandest my thoughts afar off. And he goes on later on to say that before I was actually shaped in my mother's womb, you knew all about me. You knew what I would do and what I wouldn't do. So this foreknowledge is absolutely um, staggering in, uh, as we consider it, and it is unlimited. And then, not only does it deal with my physical condition, but also with my spiritual condition, because the Bible says, for whom he did foreknow. Now this, I don't understand it again, but the same word means, uh, has to do, uh, can have to do, at least in the Old Testament, with the sexual intimacy, that in a very intimate way, before the foundation of the world, God knew me. He, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate. And Peter uh, amplifies this. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, that's the fact. We're not discussing the nature, the reason for it, but that's the fact of it. Okay, the fourth word, we've looked at decree, 
the word ordain, the word foreknowledge, and now the word election. Uh, eklektos, to elect, is to pick or choose from a number. Now, it means to select for an appointed task. For example, Christ was God's elect, and a certain group of angels have been elected. Paul speaks of this in 1 Timothy 5, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. And then the Old Testament Israel was an elect nation. Uh, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers. He could have chosen the Philistines. He could have chosen the Egyptians. But in his sovereign will, without any merit as far as the Israelite nation was concerned, God chose the nation Israel to be his representatives here on earth. And then certain men, both in Old and New Testament, were performed to an were chosen to and elected to perform important tasks in God's ministry. Uh, Jeremiah, in the womb, God chose him, and David, Abraham, John the Baptist, Paul, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve apostles were elected by God. The Bible says, When he had called unto him his twelve apostles, and then Jesus said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. And so here you have this election seen in all things in the universe. Uh, the plan of salvation was chosen by God. I don't know whether God could have chosen another plan or not. Certainly under the present circumstances he couldn't have. But the Bible says that whatever he could have done, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and he's chosen the weak things, and the reason being that no flesh would glory in his sight. And then the people of salvation were chosen by God. Now that's the fact. We have not, and I keep repeating this, we're not, at least at this point, we have not discussed the reason for this choice. The why may be unanswerable, but the fact is true. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, Paul says. Ephesians 1, 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Well, I'm going to skip over some of this. The fifth word here in this uh, eightfold summary, or at least the eight words that we're using to uh, describe the salvation origination, is the word counsel. Uh, Boluma, B-O-U-L-E-M-A. And this word refers to deliberate and to willful intention. Biblical example are the intention, the will, the counsel, the intention of the Pharisees to kill Christ, the intention of the Pharisees to kill Peter and John, the intention of the centurion to save Paul, the intention of God to offer up Christ, and the intention of God to save the elect. Decree, ordain, foreknowledge, election, counsel, or God's determination, and now purpose, uh, I'm sorry, and now predestination. And this is the word, of course, that most people think about when they think of arguing and John Calvin and and uh, hyper-Calvinism, uh, etc. But what does the word predestination mean? It comes from the Greek uh, prorizo and horazo. To predestinate is to mark out beforehand or to determine a boundary. In fact, the English word horizon comes from horizo. Our horizon then comes from this word. It is our horizon, of course, which marks out the earth from the sky. We speak of horizontal and we speak of vertical. And the Greek word is also translated by the words determination. The Greek word now translated predestination is also translated by the word determination and declaration. Now, this word, horizo, is used 
Number one, for the declaration of the deity of Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, it speaks of Jesus Christ, who was declared to be the Son of God. In other words, while he was on earth, God the Father marked off, as the horizon marks off the sky from the earth, he marked off the true identity and nature of his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And then it is used in the predetermining of the death of Christ at the hands of wicked men. And uh, Jesus and Paul, um, or Peter, brings uh, this out. And then in the predetermining of national boundaries, God marked off uh, certain national boundaries. Paul says in Acts 17, in the Sermon on Mars Hill, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped by with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So he has predetermined that the nation Japan will be where it is and America will occupy the land that we occupy here in this part of the world. And then the predetermining or the predestination of believers to be conformed to Christ. And by the way, let me just say this about predestination. Whatever else I know or don't know about it, the Bible does not use predestination in the sense of predestining some to heaven and predestining some to hell. In fact, it's not even basically dealing with the act of conversion. Predestination is to be predestined to the image of Christ. It deals with believers and not with unbelievers. As a child of God, I am then predestined predetermined. God has predetermined that I, as a child of God, should grow and be like Jesus. So it is predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that's what Paul says in Romans 8. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. That's the word horizo he marked out now. To be conformed, not to be saved or lost, because they're already saved here, to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. All right. And then number uh, G, which would be the seventh of these eight words, God's purpose. The word purpose now is a part of the concept of salvation origination. And uh, prothesis, and this literally means to set forth. God has set forth certain things. And I won't get into that. You have this in your notes. And then the final word here is the word called. And this means to officially summons to do something. For example, in Romans 8.30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, he summoned. And just as you would receive a summons from a court, you are required to be here at a certain time. Now, I suppose I get in trouble by using that word require. Uh, but yet, a summons is that. It's not an invitation. It's a requirement. Well, does this mean that the unsaved person who gets this has to be saved? Well, uh, God is not going to violate uh, the conscience or the will of any man. But this does not weaken the word call here. It does mean to officially summons to do something. So these are basically the eight words now in the subject of salvation origination. Now, after discussing very briefly the terms included within the subject of salvation origination, what about the two basic positions concerning the subject of salvation 
origination. In other words, why are some people saved and others lost? Does man have any say in his salvation, or does he have all the say? Uh, no serious Bible student, of course, will deny the fact of God's election. But however, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that good men do disagree concerning the nature, not the fact, because it's in the Bible, you can't deny it, but the nature and the background of this election. There are two basic positions here that we offer for your consideration. And position number one has been summarized by uh, two good men. One is an evangelist and not a theologian, and the other is a theologian and not evangelist. John R. Rice is the, is the evangelist. He's a good Bible teacher. Of course, he would not be a theologian in the sense of the word that the second man is, Henry Thiessen. But both Rice the well-known evangelist, and Thiessen, the well-known theologian, theologian, would both hold to position number one. And Dr. Rice has uh, uh, given a good definition of this, but let me read uh, what he has to say on page 90 of his book, Predestined for Hell, and there's question mark, and then no, exclamation mark. So that's the name of the book. And Rice says this, the only Now, he believes in election, by the way, and Thiessen believes in election, but here is the reason, their reasons for election. The only people, Rice says, that God predestines to be saved are those whom he did foreknow, that is, those who, in his infinite knowledge, God knows will, when given the opportunity, come to trust in Christ to be saved. It is not that predestination causes people to trust Christ and be saved. No, they are only predestined to be saved because God knows that they will put their trust in Christ. Now, I would not agree with Mr. Rice on this. Uh, predestination doesn't cause anybody to be saved. It does not have to deal with uh, does not have to do with our conversion, but rather with our growing to be in the image of Christ. But I'll, I'll pass that at this point. He says, finally, no, they are only predestined to be saved because God knows that they will put their trust in Christ. Predestination is based wholly on God's foreknowledge. Well, Henry Thiessen makes a similar argument and uh, we'll have to stop at this argument as I read it. As Thiessen says, Furthermore, God chose those who he foreknew would accept Christ. The Scriptures definitely base God's election on his foreknowledge. Whom he foreknew, he also foreordained, and whom he foreordained, them he called to the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And then Thiessen goes on to say, Although we are nowhere told what it is in the foreknowledge of God that determines his choice, the repeated teaching of Scripture is that man is responsible for accepting or rejecting salvation necessitates our postulating that it is man's reaction to the revelation God has made of himself that is the basis of his election. So what he's saying here is, although we are not told specifically that God's foreknowledge is actually simply crystal ball gazing and knowing that uh, if I had a chance to accept Christ, that uh, I would accept it, and on the basis God knows that, uh, he predestines me. Now, Thiessen admits that we're not really told that was the nature of his choice, what his foreknowledge involved, but he says we just uh, logically conclude that that was the basis of his foreknowledge. He says, then, may we repeat, since mankind is hopelessly dead in trespasses and sins and nothing can do nothing to obtain salvation, God graciously restores to all men sufficient ability to make a choice in the matter of submission to him. This is the salvation bringing grace of God that hath appeared to all men. 
in his foreknowledge, God perceives what each one will do with this fixed, this restored ability, and elects men to salvation in harmony with his knowledge of their choice of him. There is no merit in this transaction. Well, that's the first position. Now, we'll give you the second position during the next tape, and then we'll try to give you a few of the strong and weak points of both positions, and then we'll have a bottom-line summary of these two positions on salvation origination.